Hi, I'm Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory, and welcome to our webinar titled Getting the Most Out of Your Manometer. And we'll go over a few housekeeping items first. Um, you'll see that there's a, a chat option, and uh, please go ahead and type in questions as you think of them. Um, some of you have sent questions to me ahead of time and we'll uh, make sure and cover those at the end. And uh, actually we'll be covering all the questions at, at the end. So um, go ahead and type, type those in as you think of them and, uh, and then we'll go over responses at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded so it'll be available on our website and YouTube channel soon. And if you want to view our past webinars, um, those are all there also. And we're always looking for input on what type of webinars you'd like to see. Um, and we, we certainly take that into consideration, the feedback you give us. And a lot of the webinars we do are based on, on input from our customers. Um, so today we're going to cover, we're going to start out with, uh, with draft pressure, measuring the draft pressure in, in natural draft appliances. Um, then we'll get into combustion appliance zone pressures and um, when you're doing a, a combustion spillage test on, on natural draft or category one appliances, um, we'll, we'll go into some detail about taking those, those uh, measurements. Um, we'll talk about room pressures, whether it's um, pressures caused by air handler or uh, door closures due to worst case depressurization when you're doing the CAS test. We'll, we'll go over um, measuring those pressures and some solutions to, uh, to solving those. Um, exhaust fan flow, um, zone pressure diagnostics. So those of you who do uh, weatherization or, or are insulators doing air sealing, um, we'll, we'll talk in some detail about zone pressure diagnostics. And, and if, if you want to really go into more detail on, on, on some of these things, um, we've done past webinars on uh, zone pressure diagnostics and, and measuring uh, flow. And um, those are, are you know, full one hour sessions on, on measuring flow and on um, doing zone pressure diagnostics. So we're gonna give kind of an overview of those things today, but if you're looking for more detail, um, you can look at our, our past webinars. Um, we'll talk about uh, pressure pans, and I do tech support here at Energy Conservatory, and I often get questions on, um, on, on potential uses for, for pressure pans. So we'll, we'll talk about um, a lot of different things you can do and cannot do <laughs> with pressure pans. Um, we'll, we'll talk briefly about balancing uh, HRV, ERV. Um, that again could be a, a, a whole session onto its own, but we're just gonna talk about it in a, on a real basic level. Um, measuring static pressures in a air handler system and, and what those pressures mean. Um, and we'll talk about Wi-Fi and, and controlling um, fans and viewing pressures remotely. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then there's an option that, that many people aren't aware of where um, you can use your Wi-Fi link um, to it, um, and your DG700 as a standalone uh, data logger. And uh, we'll talk about that. So measuring draft pressures. <laughs> There's more than one kind of draft pressure, right? And, and we're not gonna talk about this one, but it, it does show you how to measure, uh, measure draft pressure there. Um, so when you're measuring um, draft, typically that's done in, in natural draft appliances using a static pressure probe. And that's shown on the left side where um, you're putting that probe in the airflow uh, measuring it inside the pipe and that static pressure probe has got a magnet on it and it has a 90 degree bend in it. It has a sealed bullet shaped end on it and then it has holes on the side. So it's measuring the outward pressure in the pipe, the bursting pressure sometimes it's referred to or the static pressure. 
Um, you can also use just a straight probe to measure draft pressure because the velocity is low enough. The, um, um, the pressure you would measure with just a straight probe, as long as, as long as it's pointing at a 90 degree angle to the, to the pipe, just like the static pressure probe is showing, um, and it's not pointing in, into the airflow. You'll notice if you point into the airflow too much or away from the airflow, you'll get some variations. But if it's going straight into the pipe, um, that, that's pretty good measurement of, of draft pressure. Um, high, um, high stack pressure doesn't necessarily mean it's not spilling. And a good example of that is if you have a 75,000 B2 water heater and um, um, 75,000 BTU water heater, and it's vented with a three inch pipe. Um, you're, you're gonna see really high draft pressure, right? Because the air is just gonna be streaming up through that, through that three inch pipe. But you're gonna have spillage too. That pipe isn't big enough for all that exhaust to go up. So you're gonna have some of that air uh, probably a good portion of that air is going to be coming out the draft because it can't fit. Um, 75,000 BTUs can't fit through a three inch pipe. Um, so you have a really strong draft pressure and spillage um, at the same time. If you increase that to a four inch or better yet for 75,000 BTUs, a five inch vent connector, um, now you're going to have more volume of air going up through that, um, but you're gonna have a lower static pressure. So in, in this case, lower static pressure is, is, is actually better because uh, that pipe is sized properly. All the exhaust is going up the chimney. Um, static pressure is lower, but more total air is going up the chimney because it's sized properly. So um, good draft pressure doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting a good flow of air or, uh, where all the air is going up the chimney. Um, so checking for spillage uh, is important, um, seeing if there's, if there's exhaust uh, um, air coming out of, the, out of the draft hood and checking for that with smoke. Uh, if you've got a smoke puffer, uh, even checking with the back of your hand or the front of your hand, you know, you can, you can feel it or, or puff some smoke in there, see if all the smoke is going up to the chimney. Um, but for a pass-fail criteria, I like measuring temperature. Um, and you can, in this photo, you may be able to see there's a couple of uh, thermal couple um, thermometers that are, that are going up to the draft hood and they're, they're measuring temperature at that location, right? You're still in the ambient air, but you're right near where the air is, is going up into the draft hood, uh, about a quarter inch away from that metal or so. And uh, you're measuring temperature at that location. And what we, um, I used to work in the sound insulation program around the Minneapolis where they're insulating homes for sound around the airport. And we were doing air quality testing on all those before and after we did the work. And we were using um, uh, 40 degrees. So we'd measure it at, 30, at 40 degrees above ambient, above the room temperature. So if it was, um, we'd measure it at three different locations and if the average was above 40 degrees, then we would consider that a failure. So that gives you a good pass fail criteria. Or if any one of those was above 55. And um, we did some research on that and that equates to about 10% spillage, 10% of the exhaust is going up the chimney. So it gives you a, a definite pass fail criteria because oftentimes it's hard puffing smoke to do a, a quantitative uh, measurement. So that's, that's what we used. Um, so um, next we'll kind of move from uh, spillage and draft pressure to uh, measuring um, the combustion appliance zone uh, pressure. So what this is, is it's a uh, combustion appliance zone um, um, pressure test is when you're, you're measuring the pressure in, in the furnace room, or the room where the water heater or furnace are, or boiler, um, with respect to outside, and you're seeing what pressure change is caused by, by turning on exhaust fans or turning on the air handler or, or closing doors. Um, 
And um, so we're, 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 um, we're doing, this is kind of a diagnostic test um, as to the potential for spillage with nat natural draft appliances. Is it, is it close to failing? Um, is it a long ways in, from failing and it's, it, it's really good? Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're measuring. Natural draft appliances, depressurizing the house by turning the exhaust fans on and uh, measuring how much that pressure changes. Um, so combustion spillage can be caused by, by bad venting um, house depressurization, or both. So we'll have to we'll have to determine um, what what the main cause is, or what the multiple causes are, and uh, figure out separate solutions for for each separate problem. Um, spillage solutions can get complicated pretty quickly, and um, again we could. We could do a long session on that. You know, we're going to kind of cover the basics. Gathering good data is critical. Um, you want to you want to see if that how that venting is working, uh, how that venting is has been installed, um, and and how close is that to meeting code. Um, that's an important part of it because it can be it can be bad venting, it can be depressurization, or it can be both. Um, and then for depressurization, we're going to um, want to take a baseline pressure and see how much fluctuation we're getting with that baseline. Um, and, and a good way to do this, to see, to get a quick sense of how much fluctuation there is due to, um, due to wind, is to set, um, set your gauge on a five second time average. And it'll flash a new number every five seconds and write down five five second averages so it, you know that goes pretty quickly 30 seconds you've got all your data and it gives you a, a, a good snapshot in time on how much the wind is fluctuating and and you want to look at the difference between the highest and lowest of those numbers and if that's you know 0.5 uh, pascals or something that's that's a pretty calm day if it's um, five pascals difference between the highest and lowest and, and we're trying to measure five pascals, um, we're gonna have a hard time <laughs> on, that, on that given date. So um, using, uh, we've got a graphing software called TechLog um, and that works great on, on uh, windy days to, uh, to be able to visually see those pressures. That really becomes a game changer once instead of those numbers bouncing all the way around on your gauge, um, being able to, to visually see those pressures. So depressurization can be caused by um, uh, fans, any, any exhaust fans, kitchen fans, bath fans. Uh, don't forget the clothes dryer that's exhausting air out of the house too. Um, an air handler can, can change the pressure in the house. Um, if, if there's supply leaks to the outside, it's blowing air to the outside just like an exhaust fan would and will cause depressurization. Um, if the leaks are on the return side, um, then it'll do just the opposite. It's, it's sucking air from the outside and blowing it air, air into the house. It's blowing air into the house, so it will, it will make the house more positive. Um, and if, if those leaks are equal in size and pressure, um, then then you you could potentially have no change in uh, you could have a lot of duct leaks and, and no change in pressure and those are on a windy day it's going to be almost impossible to determine that because unless your air handler is changing the pressure in the house a lot just by turning the air handler on and that certainly can't happen if you have a lot of duct leaks um, but um, so. Turning the air handler on and off a couple of times and looking at those pressures can give you an indication of what's going on there. And then closing doors. So, um, so if we've got, you know, now we've got our, our, we turn on all of our exhaust fans and the clothes dryer first, and then, then we can take some more pressure measurements and see how much change in pressure is caused by turning on those fans. Um, next, turn on the air handler, see if we, if we notice a change in pressure, and then start, 
start closing doors and see how that changes the pressure in the house. In door closure, when we we're in this situation, because we've got all the exhaust fans on and we have the air handler on now at this point, um, uh, and, and this is more, um, I'm gonna back up for a minute. Um, ResNet and BPI both have protocols on how to set up a house to do a, a, a CAS test. And, and, um, and then you determine if there's combustion spillage at that point. And that's not what I'm really talking about now. What I'm talking about is, is what we're trying to do now is if we have a failure, we're going step by step on how to diagnose those problems. Um, so we're not, um, our, this protocol is, is certainly gonna be different than those protocols are, but we're, we're using these numbers to try to troubleshoot the problems at this point. Um, so um, closing the door can change the pressure in a house in a couple of different ways. Um, one way, if um, you know, a house where we, we saw um, big issues locally here was a story and a half house and the second floor um, was finished off and with, with tongue and groove pine paneling that's, that's really leaky to start with. Then they cut a couple of, of leaky attic hatches to get into the side attics to store all their stuff. And they've got some built-in drawers on each side um, that are really leaky. So it's so really leaky upstairs. And there's a door at the bottom of the stairs going up into that space. And if we do a blow at our test, and then we close that door and do another blow at our test, what happens? Well, now our zone is, is twice as tight. Our, our CFM 50 is half with that door closed to what it is. So now we've made the combustion zone much tighter. So it's gonna be affected by pressures a lot more. So just closing the door in itself can be a problem. And we can also have um, a supply duct with no returns in that space. And now if, if we turn on the air handler, now it's blowing a hundred or, or maybe there's two registers and it's blowing 150 CFM up there. And, um, and that's acting like an exhaust fan because it's so leaky up there. So that's door closure kind of is a double whammy in that it's, it's making the combustion air zone smaller and tighter. And uh, if we've got supply air blowing into a leaky space, it's gonna depressurize the house more also. Um, so again, we're, we're gonna need, um, depending on which of these things is causing the problem, we're gonna need different solutions for each. Um, so if we've got, if we've got, there, there's a couple of different instances where you're gonna wanna provide pressure relief in, in um, bedrooms, for example. Um, one might be if you've got a central return and, and you're just trying to get the, the air from that room to return um, um, back to the furnace, you're gonna wanna do this test and, um, and see how much of a pressure relief you're gonna wanna make in order to, um, to relieve the pressure in those rooms. Because remember what's happening is, is you're closing that door and you're building up a pressure in that room and, and that air is gonna go somewhere. It's not gonna return back to the furnace. Um, it's also gonna leak through all the leaks in, in the room. Um, remember, in order to, to have a leak, you need a hole and a pressure. So any holes that are in that room um, will have a pressure across them and they, there will be leakage across all of those holes. Um, one of the holes is underneath the door, so some of the air will return there. The other air will be going either to another room or to the outdoors um, based on, on where the leaks are. So. Um, so you are, you are creating leakage to the outside if you're pressurizing a room. So you might be doing it just for that reason. Um, or you might, you might be trying to reduce your uh, worst case depressurization numbers. And, and in that case, you'll have all the exhaust fans on and be checking the pressure in that room and wanting to relieve the pressure in that room for that reason. So, um, so first we'll, we'll measure the pressure under the door with with the door closed. 
So we've got all the exhaust fans on, we've got all of the doors open. We're gonna close one door and on our gauge, we're gonna have the, Im usually I'll use channel A for this because channel A is always pressure, right? It's never measuring a flow. It's always measuring a pressure. So if you just use channel A, you don't have to pay attention to what the mode settings are. Um, and you'll connect it to the input on channel A and you're measuring with reference to the room. So you're standing out in the hallway, you're throwing the tube under the door, you're closing it and measuring a pressure. And um, if that pressure is positive, then, then you need to relieve that pressure. If that pressure is negative, then you've got something else going on. <laughs> um, um, and then what I recommend is opening that door until the pressure drops to one Pascal. And, and this is more for, you know, I've seen other, other protocols where they use three Pascals and, and you'll want to follow the, you know, whatever protocol your, your organization has come up with. Um, and, and there may not be much of a difference between three Pascals and one Pascal, but, but I usually, I'm conservative and, and I'll go to um, open it until, until that pressure in the room drops to one Pascal. Um, and then that tells you, um, measure how many square inches you had to open that door and it gives you an idea of the net free area of relief. Um, now what, what I used to do is um, I take a, a pencil or a pen and close the door on that. So a pencil or a pen is about three eighths of an inch in diameter. And, um, and that would equate to about an inch of undercutting that door. If you've got a typical two foot six bathroom door, um, if you um, open that, that door three eighths of an inch and, um, and it relieves the pressure to one Pascal, then, then undercutting the door an inch is going to be a solution. Not many people are going to want their doors undercut more than an inch. So, <laughs> um, so that's kind of your limit there. But um, so, um, so that you figure out the net free area. If you know a door is 80 inches tall and if you open it an inch, that's about 80 net uh, net free inches, and you'll need to use charts by the the um, register and grill manufacturers to see based on the opening of that, um, um, based on the size of that grill, what the net free area is. Um, you know, with all the louvers on it, etc. It's not you're not going to measure just the hole you cut in the sheetrock. You're going to need to know what the net area of that net free area of that opening is and um and then you can you can put either a grill on uh, above a door uh one on the, the room side and one on the hallway side to relieve the pressure straight through or i've seen people also um so you're you've got more of a sound buffer you can put one grill up high on the inside and one down low in the hallway or um another Thing that's done in different parts of the country are jumper ducts uh, that would go up into the attic from uh, from one room to another. So flex duct going to two grills, one in one in the bedroom, one in the hallway. All right. Um, oh, another thing to keep in mind with um, with grills and registers is if. If you're putting one up high and one down low, um, you've got a bottleneck in there of, of a stud width is only three and a half inches. So, so using a, a 12 by 16 grill, you're not going to get um, um, 12 inches of, of air down through a three and a half inch opening. So you're going to need to go with more of a long skinny grill over maybe two stud cavities rather than a square grill. Um, because you can't, you can't move, um, um, you know, if your grill is eight inches tall, you can't move eight inches worth of air into a three and a half inch space without a pressure drop. All right, and then um, exhaust fan flows is um, typically we'll, we'll just take a, a, a gauge in a box. And uh, before the Energy Conservatory came out with the exhaust fan flow meter, 
we used to just use a cardboard box with a 30 square inch hole and, and we use the formula um, square inch, uh, the you know, 1.07 times the area in square inches times the square root of the pressure gives you flow. Um, so you could, you could just use, um, you know, that formula in a box, but, um, but the exhaust fan flow meter is, is much easier to use and it, it looks a lot more professional and, and you're going to get more accurate readings over a wider range of, of pressures than, than just cutting, just having one hole size. Um, so it, it has uh, uh, three different, the gate is adjustable at three different openings and it can measure flow from um, between 10 and um, 100, about 110 um, or 120 uh, CFM. Um, larger pressures than that, you know, if you've got exhaust fans, like um, some through the wall kitchen fans can move three, four, 500 CFM. They're like little mini duct plaster fans in, in the wall. And, um, and you can have very high flows and uh, you, you may need to make your own larger box and, and use that formula um, to, uh, to get airflow through those. We, I did do, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I did a webinar previously about measuring flow. And um, towards the end of that webinar, um, it talked about measuring flow through kitchen fans, which, which can get a lot trickier. And, and I get a lot of phone calls on how do I measure flow through kitchen fans. And um, it talks about three or four different ways um, that you can measure flow through kitchen fans. And uh, there, there isn't a silver bullet that'll work every time. Um, depending on the conditions, um, you, you will want to use different methods will be, will be easier and more accurate. So if you want to go into more detail on that, it's the, um, the webinar on measuring flow and it's the last, I think maybe 10 or 15 minutes of that webinar talked about kitchen fan flow. So there's that formula. Um, the CFM is, is uh, this isn't exactly the formula we use for the exhaust fan flow meter because that's, that's actually calibrated. Um, but if you're just using a cardboard box, 1.07 times the um, square inches of area of the opening of the hole that you cut in the box um, times the square root of the pressure. All right. Um, next, we'll we'll talk about about uh, zone pressure diagnostics, and um, and usually this is done between um, you're measuring the pressure between a between a attic space and the house, or between an attached garage and the house, um, with the house at fifty pascals, and um, the, it, it's more important in in uh, cold climates and cold weather um, than if if you don't have much of a temperature difference between inside and outside. But it is important to baseline your zonal pressure numbers, um, so that that becomes important. And and we, again, we go into more detail on that um, in our in our zone pressure diagnostic webinar. But but it does become important to um, um, to be measuring um, to baseline your attic zonal measurement. So when you baseline your your gauge to do a blower or test, um, having a second gauge and, and baselining that um, um, attic with reference to outside or attic with reference to house numbers uh, becomes important. Um, so that just just simply taking that measurement um, gives you a good good indication if that zone is more inside or or if it's more outside if you're measuring with reference to that zone um, and you expect that zone to, to be outside you should be measuring 50 pascals if if um, if that zone is 
happens to be completely inside, um, you could be measuring no pressure. It could be the same pressure as the house. So you'd be measuring zero pressure. Um, so it, it's likely to be somewhere between zero and 50. It's not likely to be one or the other, um, but that tells you um, whether that zone is more, more inside or more outside. And, and in, uh, um, you really want that zone to be close to the same temperature and relative humidity as outside, so you don't have uh, mold and mildew and, and um, uh, durability uh, problems in that, in that attic space with things getting moldy or rotting. Um, and um, so you want that space to be, to be more outside. And your insulation is going to be much more effective if, if um, the pressure boundary and the thermal boundary line up and, and they're sealed really well. You're gonna, your insulation is going to work a lot better. So, um, so there's good reasons for just taking that number. Um, see if that if that attic is more inside than out um, when, when it, it, it should be should always be outside um, so that what that um, number tells you is the relative size of the hole so um, so in these two diagrams down in the lower left here um, if you have a if you have a zonal reading of 25 pascals that's telling you the hole between the house and the attic is the same size as the hole between the attic and outside. So we've got our house at 50, our attic uh, baseline adjusted attic pressure is 25. So now um, we know that that size of the whole house to attic is about the same size as the whole attic to outside. It doesn't tell us anything about the whole, the size of the holes. Either it could be really tiny holes or it could be really huge holes. We don't know that. All we know is that the, the relative size of the holes are, are the same. Um, if we're measuring between the house and the attic and we're 48, we're almost 50, so it's almost outside. Uh, it's almost completely outside. We know that the relative size of the holes is a 1 8 to 1 ratio. Um, it, it, again, it doesn't tell us anything about um, about the size of the holes, but it tells us about the ratio of the holes. Now, one thing you'll notice here is this, the, the second diagram at 48, that hole is the same size as the hole when it's 25. So it, it's possible to get a zone reading of uh, 25 or a zone reading of 48 with the same amount of bypasses between the house and the attic. So that's that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, but you don't want to be reading 25 pascals and leave that and say that's okay. You either want to go at that and uh, see more bypasses or you want to maybe you only have one roof vent on that whole house and you want to add a couple more roof vents. That will make the house leakier um, but, um, but now that attic is going to be more, more outside, which is our goal. And our pressure boundary and thermal boundary are going to line up better. Um, the, uh, the amount of venting in an attic isn't as important as houses get tighter and tighter. So if, if a house is really tight, attic venting isn't as critical. Um, but you still want to, you still want to get a, um, even if you've done a super job of sealing the attic bypasses, you want to have enough venting in the attic. That's a reasonable thing to ask. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind is you, you could potentially, um, uh, on this really, um, you, could, you could add more attic venting alone and that'll make your, your, um, your attic zonal readings look better. Um, but it'll also make your house leakier. So, um, you know, if, if you have, you know, a ratio like this and, and you change it to, um, to this, your, your blower door reading will go up. If you're already starting with a big hole and you start adding more holes in your, your, your blower number is going to get horrendous. But, um, 
but you could you could make your adding zonal readings uh, um, look better just by adding roof roof venting, and um, um, and but you will be making the house leakier uh, in that process. And it is important for durability reasons to uh, to um, reduce the leaks between the house and the attic as much as you can. So here's a chart. Um, we do have on our website, there's a free software you can download um, uh, called ZPD Trainer. And um, in the help menu of, of that software, you'll, you'll see these charts that, uh, that we have shown here. Um, and, and that will show the ratio. So here we've got um, 25 and 25 is a one-to-one -one ratio. We showed down here, two and 48 is a one-eighth-to-one ratio. So you can kind of get an idea from that. All right, next we'll move on to uh, the pressure pan. Um, people will, will use this as part of uh, pressure diagnostics and um, what you want to remember when you're using the pressure pan for pressure diagnostics, so it, you know, in this example, that might be uh, put over an outlet, let's say. And um, what you're doing is you're creating um, another zone, right? And you're measuring the pressure in that zone. And with the, with the gasket on there, that, that zone is going to be pretty tight to the house. So what you're really measuring is the pressure in that stud cavity. Um, it, that's going to be pretty close to if you would have taken off that plate and put a probe um, alongside the electrical box into that stud cavity, um, putting a pressure pan over that outlet will give you a very similar reading. So you're reading the pressure really in that, in that stud cavity. Um, and, and that can give you uh, you know, kind of an inclination if if that stud cavity is is well connected. If um, if maybe there's a drop soffit would be a good reason um, for for checking that. If if there's a drop soffit detail in a you know, above this stud cavity to see if that stud cavity is open into the attic. Um, see if there's a connection between the stud cavity and the attic space. Um, I've often gotten asked um, when people do um, ceiling recess lights and they're trying to use the pressure pan to uh, to tell if that is leaky or not and and that that's not um, that's not a good way to determine if a recess light is sealed or not um, a better way would be to use your exhaust fan flow meter and you can use that for measuring airflow right but you'd have to be pressurizing the house. You'd have to pressurize the house because with the exhaust fan flow meter, air needs to come into that. Air needs to be coming into that exhaust fan. You can't use it to measure supply or anything where air is blowing in through that gasket inside of the pan. It needs to be going the other way. It needs to be going through that adjustable hole and out through the exhaust fan to, to measure properly. So if you're using it for pressure diagnostics on a recess light and you want to know how many CFM reduction you could get, um, you would have to, um, you know, you use that with, with it, that hole being the smallest and then it could read uh, a flow down to, um, down to about 10 CFM, but if you want to measure anything smaller than that, you'll have to tape it off and make that hole smaller and then use that formula. Uh, but you could you could pressurize the house and use that exhaust fan flow meter to measure flow through a uh, recess light. Um, most often, I mean, what we, we created the pressure pan for um, wasn't initially for pressure diagnostics, although a lot of people have adapted and started using it for that. Um, it was used to diagnose um, where duct leaks are, the location of duct leaks in a duct system. Um, so you, and, and you would have to do that during a, as part of a blower door test. So when you do a, a straight duct leakage test, you're doing a total leakage, um, you've got a number, it doesn't really tell you where the duct leaks are. But 
during your blower dart test um, with the house at 50 pascals, um, you can go around and, um, and put the pressure pan over the registers one at a time and, uh, and measure that pressure. And the pressure that's the highest is closest to the biggest leak. So it's a way of diagnosing where, where the dark leakage problems are. All right, um, uh, Brown uh, Benmar used to be um, uh, a brand name that had these pressure taps on, and, and they, they, within the last couple of years, they, they've been sold to Brown. Um, so Benmar, uh, I think, still exists in Canada, but um, um, it's all gone over to Brown now. And, and there may be other manufacturers too, but what I'm, what I'm trying to point out is you can see the four, the four holes, the four taps on the side of this. Um, and those taps are for balancing the system. So, and, and remember there's a plug in there. <laughs> if you just stick the pressure tap in there, you're, you're not gonna get a pressure reading. Well, you'll get a pressure reading because it's, it's, uh, it's a sealed tap, but, but you're not getting the, you're not getting the right reading. So you need to pull that, you need to pull that plug out of there and it's sized to fit the tubing size that we use for, um, for blower dart testing. Um, and you'll put, um, you'll have to look at the, the uh, instruction manual to see how you measure the pressure. With, with some, um, you're measuring straight across uh, horizontally, in other ones you're measuring the pressure diagonally. So you want to make sure and, and look at what model um, each every year ERV it is and to see um, how you, you measure those, those connections. And then there's a chart on the side of the, um, of the device where you convert that pressure to flow. Um, you're not trying to get those pressures equal, you're trying to get the flows equal. So you need to convert those pressures to flow and see if the flow, uh, to get the flow equal and then use the balancing damper to, to close down one side or the other um, and, and balance the system. So this is uh, really the, the best way uh, out there to, uh, to balance the ERV, HRV. If, if you have one that, that doesn't have taps, then, um, then that would take uh, another <laughs> half day session to, to go over all the possibilities and what works and doesn't work. Yeah. Not many things work well with, with um, trying to balance ERVs and HRVs that are either connected to an air handler and, and especially if they're vented with uh, flex duct, it's hard to, yeah hard to get accurate readings um, by measuring in the duct. All right, next we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, um, external static pressures in an in a air handler system. And, um, and this is, is really helpful for, for um, diagnosing where the pressure problems are occurring. You're measuring high static pressure. Well, what's causing that, that high static pressure? Uh, where, where are the biggest pressure drops in, in the system? Um, typically, uh, on the nameplate of an air handler, it, it, will, it will say what, what the maximum external static pressure is. And, and this is our static pressures you should, um, you should shoot for. Um, and if you go too much over that, it's going to be harder on harder on most motors, and, um, and 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 will really reduce the amount of flow going through the system if you get much higher than than that recommended external static. And and a typical uh, maximum external static pressure is 0.5. Um, if you're if you're in a heavy air conditioning area, you might you might see 0 0.6, 0 0.7 um, for air handlers that, um, that have more flow. Um, but, uh, but you can see what that, that um, maximum external static pressure is. And 0.5 inches of water column is equal to 120, about 125 Pascals. So, um, so then you can get an idea. 
and that that um, the maximum external static pressure you're measuring um, the pressure uh, across the fan typically um, and and you're measuring what that pressure is so in this case we've got we've got that um, um, pressure on the, the fan side of the filter so between the filter and the um, and the air handler cabinet and it's pointed into the direction of the airflow remember and we've got it below the air conditioning coil and, and we're measuring that pressure um, if if your air handler is a is a package unit that comes with the air conditioning built into it then, then they're typically measuring the external static pressure above the coil because every unit is going to be shipped with a coil. Um, so they're um, in that coil is is fit um, to work with that air handler. So if it comes with if that unit comes with an air conditioning coil, then you're going to want to um, measure um, the static pressure above the coil. Um, and again, that, that um, we're not really talking about measuring. There's a lot of other places you can measure um, external static pressure. You can measure pressures across a filter and, and see what they are. Um, you could measure pressures from, you know, from, from one end of the ductwork to the other and see how much drop there is across there. You could see how much drop there is across a grill Usually it wouldn't be very much, but in some cases you can have a high pressure drop just across if you've got a really restricted um, if you've got a really restricted um, grill, um, you might have a pressure drop across that, and that might be adding to the the um, the external static pressures. Um, Uh, and, and you know, in a previous webinar, we did, and I believe that was the one again on measuring airflow, where we we talked in more detail about what to expect for uh, pressures across across filters and pressures across uh, air conditioner coils. All right, and uh, um, with uh, with the DG seven hundred, we we've stopped. Um, We've stopped making the DG700s um, and uh, because it's, it's older technologies and we're not able to get all the parts anymore and uh, we want to hold back enough parts so we continue doing repairs on them uh, into the future. Um, we are going to continue calibrating them. There, there's no reason why we would stop calibrating DG700 so we'll continue calibrating them and, uh, and we should have most parts for um, at least three or four years and uh, and then you know re some repairs will, will taper off but but I think majority of the repairs and um, and the calibrations will go on uh, for quite a while into the future if you're interested in adding Wi-Fi capability to your TG 700 we do have uh, or we, we are still selling the Wi-Fi link and then you can um, that can talk to your um, smartphone or your computer or iPad through through Wi-Fi and this device um, sends out a Wi-Fi signal and you connect directly to that signal so you don't need a router or the internet or you don't have to worry about any of those things you're just making a direct connection it's broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal it'll show up on your Wi-Fi networks and you connect to that just like you connect to any um, any router um, and um, uh, and you have to enter the password the first time you use it with that gauge. Um, you have to enter the, the password, which is TEC Wi-Fi 12. Um, the new uh, DG1000 has, has built-in Wi-Fi capabilities. Um, you can also connect it to, uh, to a computer using cable, either Ethernet or um, where it comes with a 15-foot USB cable. So you've got, you've got some options, but in most cases, uh, Wi-Fi will work great. 
Um, so that gives you the ability with either the, the 700 or the 1000 of connecting to a, to a phone, a tablet, or a PC. Um, and we do have, um, so you could do a blower dart test from your phone is basically what it is. And one of them, um, the uh, TDC gauge app is simply, you know, gives you the ability to see pressures remotely or, or to control the fan um, and run a blower dart test um, from your phone or, or your tablet or your PC. Um, we do have uh, various versions of software that um, allow you to do either single point tests or automated tests. Um, with the new, those of you who do home energy ratings, um, ResNet has come out with a new 380 standard and they want the blower dart test to follow that standard now. Um, we do have um, an app that will do that called TEC Auto Test. And you can choose the ResNet 380 uh, multi-point test standard and, uh, and it generates a nice report. You can do the test and it generates a nice report for that. If you're using a, a, a PC computer, um, the uh, ASTM E779 it is very similar to um, ResNet 380 and ResNet is accepting. Um, if you follow the, um, the ASTM E779 standard, and, and that one is available on um, Tektite Express. So if you're used to Tektite, Tektite Express is very similar, but it just has different has a different reporting format and um, for, for generating reports, and um, it has different test standards um, in it. And E779 is one of those. Um, so you can do you can do uh, an automated test from from an Android or an Apple phone or an Android or an Apple tablet, and uh, and it generates a nice PDF report that you could e email off right away. Um, you've also um, with the TEC gauge you have um, an option of uh, capturing the data and. Um, And um, and that it just it just captures very very basic pressure and flow um, data, and uh, it puts a timestamp on it, so um, that gives you you know a real basic amount of information with with the TEC gauge app. Um, the uh, TEC auto test is is a much better solution for uh, for that. Um, you can also, you know, if you can, you can also always do a screenshot where you take a picture of your screen and then you've got a record of your, your test also. Um, and uh, you can, um, it, um, it, it's nice if you're doing, if you are doing duct leakage outside, you can, you can set your cage um, remotely. So you, You've got your blower dart set up. You've got your duct plaster set up. You need to run both fans at the same time. Um, when you're in the in the um, over by the duct plaster fan, ready to do your test, you can set your blower dart to cruise 50, and you can see or 25 rather. And when you see it get to 25, then you can start adjusting and start zeroing out your duct plaster gauge. So it's kind of nice to be able to do that. Or if you're doing a has depressurization test. You got your gauge down the combustion zone, and um, and the furnace room, and you can walk around the house and see pressure changes as you're turning on fans or closing doors. Um, there is also the ability to do long-term data logging using um, the DG700, and if you're leaving it there for an extended period of time, um, we have a splitter and uh, AC adapter, so you can plug that into a wall and um, use, a, um, it's called iTech uh, 700 for a PC. It's a PC-based software that will put your Wi-Fi link in a data logging mode. Um, and then, um, you, you know, connect tubes to it and you can measure whatever pressure you want and you can data log it over time. So you could leave it there for a year if you wanted to. But if you're doing diagnostic work and you want to see when, uh, 
measure the, the draft in the water heater and the combustion zone, or you want to measure how often the air handler comes on or how often bath fans are used. You can measure pressure in the bath fan or kitchen fan. Whatever pressures you might want to record over time, um, it gives you the ability of, to do that. And then it saves it as a tech log file, and you can open it in tech log and see the graph of, of the pressures over time. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, to download that software and go to the settings uh, menu and then the logging menu and, um, and, and uh, you would set everything up uh, for that. All right. So now we've got, uh, we've got times, time for some questions. We've just got a, a few minutes left in the webinar. And um, if you want to hang around, you're certainly welcome to hang around for the whole, uh, the whole series of questions. Um, like I mentioned, we will be recording this also. So if you want to, if you've got to get back to work, um, don't have time to sit around and listen to the questions. Um, you can view those questions later once we upload this onto our website. Um, so, um, one question is with the DG1000, um, is there any compensation for uh, altitude? Um, uh, there is. Um, there is if if you use the DG uh, or the um, on the DG one thousand itself, there's no it does not um, make a compensation uh, for altitude. And the same with with uh, and that's part of the density correction. There's two parts of the density correction that that you need to do. One is the temperature difference between inside and outside, and the other is the altitude. So if you're in a mountainous area. Um, um, you, you need to make adjustments for, for both temperature and altitude in order to get the correct readings. Um, there is a way, if you're using the, the DG1000 with the iTech 700 or the, um, the TC Auto Test app, um, if, you, if you're doing that on your phone or if you have an iPad that where you can get a, uh, an internet connection or has a phone connection rather, um, um, you can use the location finder, and that location finder does a couple of things. It, it finds where you are, and it tells you what the address is at that location, and, and then you can choose that to, to uh, input all of that, that uh, address information about the house into the, um, into the reporting software, so you don't have to enter that information manually. And it automatically pulls in the altitude of that address. Um, so when you um, when you're running your blower door test, it will enter that information in there, so you don't have to enter that in manually. So that's that's one way around it. But currently, it doesn't um, doesn't correct for altitude. Um, when balancing a ERV or HRV, what taps are used on the DG700? Um, again, we're, we're measuring just a pressure. We're not measuring flow. We're measuring a pressure, and we're converting that pressure to flow. Um, so if, if that, the instructions for that manual say you need to use the two diagonal ports to measure either in the uh, exhaust side or um, the intake side, you'll connect, you'll, you'll connect two hoses um, one on each diagonal, and you'll connect both of those tubes to the same side of the DG1000. Um, and, and again, channel A is always reading pressure, um, so I'd recommend connecting them to that side. If you want to read both pressures at the same side, that's certainly an option. You would just set your DG1000 in the pressure pressure mode, so both sides are reading pressure, and then you could connect the four tubes two diagonals to one side, one input, one reference, the other two diagonals to the, to the other side, uh, the right side of the gauge, um, one on input, one on reference, and it's reading the pressure difference between those two locations. Um, so that's how you would um, uh, connect that to the DG700.
Um, any plans on making more apps for uh, for Windows phones? Um, I, I I don't know if that's on our, our list of things to do. So um, it's my understanding that Windows phones are are um, they're Android phones, but they have a separate Windows operating system. I, I don't. I guess I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Um, I don't know what the difference is between a Windows phone and an Android phone. I, I would assume any app that we make for an Android would work on a Windows phone. I know that's not true across all apps, but um, but there we go. Um, we do have a, a long list of. Um, of things that people have, have asked for, and um, we're certainly looking for input on what kind of apps you'd like to see, um, what kind of things would make would make your life easier. Um, we're uh, one of the things we're working towards now is is uh, being able to if if you work um, with a tablet out in the field where your your all of your data you're not writing anything down. All of your data is, is going right into your iPad. And um, and right now you're having to write down your bloater number and your um, your um, pressure pan numbers and your room pressures and, and uh, uh, attic zonal numbers and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, what, what we'd like to work towards is um, being able to have um, being able to push those numbers directly into your software. Um, there needs to be a connection made somehow. If you've got web-based software, it's, it's uh, easier, um, and it would require um, some, some programming on your end to make that happen. Um, and we would have to work with, with your organization to make that happen. And, and we are currently working with some groups um, and doing some research on, on making that happen. Um, the DG1000 also has a Bluetooth capability that we're not using yet, but, but we are, uh, we have come up with a couple of examples of, of um, um, where we could use that and we're doing some research um, on that now. So, um, oh, I guess I got a note here that, that no, <laughs> we're, we're not playing on making more apps at work with Windows phones. Um, so yeah, we're looking for, for input on, on both uh, additional webinars that, um, that you'd like to see us do and additional apps and, uh, that you'd like to, to see us come up with. And um, the, the, the DG1000 has a lot of potential because it has an onboard computer and you know, we can keep uh, adapting and adjusting over time to keep that up to date, and um, we'd like to get your input on what you'd like to see. So, thanks for attending. <laughs>